Hello everyone, this is Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine, coming to you from Arlington, Virginia, not far from the defensive perimeter that used to be here around the time of the Civil War. We'll be talking tonight about Civil War photography, specifically some interesting finds that I've had over the last week as part of my job as editor and publisher of Military Images. I'll also be taking questions that have been submitted over the last couple of hours and in fact the last couple of days. So I want to welcome everyone. Uh, I see uh, Fred Taylor is on. Hey Fred. Uh, David Yunt. Um, we've got uh, a submission from David that we're going to talk about. And um, as others join, we're going to uh, get into a little bit of the dialogue here. Um, I also want to let everyone know that this is a work in progress. This is a new program. This is episode three, and I'm very interested to have your feedback, your ideas, your ways to um, reach out and answer your questions. Uh, I often talk about the fact that the Civil War community is a well-knit group of folks who are among the most generous people that I've met, and sharing ideas, sharing thoughts in the betterment of the community, and really to seek a greater understanding of the role of Civil War portrait photography is what we're all about in the magazine, and I hope that we can accomplish the same thing here with the program. So I want to start out with uh, something that I mentioned last week, uh, and uh, it's an, an, Im an image that appeared a few issues ago in the magazine, and I'm going to hold it up here for you. Uh, this is Moses Brown Jenkins of the 1st Rhode Island Infantry. Um, something that really struck me about his personal story uh, is, is that he was a man of wealth. Um, his family made money in the textile business in Rhode Island, and um, uh, he was the kind of guy who really didn't have to go to war. But in April of 1861, after Fort Sumter, he actually had plans to go to Europe with his family, and he tore up the tickets and he enlisted in the first Rhode Island. So he's posed here in a really great image that comes from the Rick Carlisle collection, dressed in his uh, Burnside outfit with his uh, scarlet colored knapsack, and he's wearing a haversack that's personalized. It's a great photo. A couple weeks ago, I had uh, uh, an email and then a phone call from a gentleman out in Arizona who had a grouping of letters from Moses uh, Brown Jenkins. And um, he shared those letters. I showed them to you last week. And um, since that time, we've transcribed the first one. Um, and that letter is dated July 22nd, 1861, an auspicious day, uh, the first battle of Manassas, which in fact was fought about 23 miles from where I'm sitting today. And um, Moses' letter really touched me because uh, nowadays it would probably have been a couple of texts. Uh, it might have been uh, something that he tweeted to his family to let him know that it was safe. It's before he was able to write a long battle letter and describe everything he saw. This is a visceral letter written by someone who wants to inform his family about the fact that he's safe. And he shares a little bit of his interest. He's very much in the moment. He has stumbled back 23 miles from the Bull Run or Manassas battlefield. And he quickly wrote this letter to his sister. So I've got a printout of this letter here so you can see it. And what I want to do is read it to you just to give you a flavor of what it was like to be uh, in Washington, D.C. with the Union Army after it retreated. You've got one individual, he's made a long march, he's no doubt tired, the next day he's written this letter. So let me share it with you. It says, Dearest Anna, that's his sister, I have just time this evening to drop you a line to inform you of my preservation from every danger yesterday at the Battle of Manassas and of my continued good health, for which I am truly thankful for yesterday, was a terrible day for all of us, which will be remembered for the remainder of our lives. We think that our company C did not lose a single man. One or two were allegedly wounded, men whom you do not know. 
but nothing serious. You cannot imagine, dearest Anna, with what solicitude we inquired for each other when the enemy had retreated after we had been exposed to a galling fire in an open field for more than an hour. What hearty shakes of the hand were given and what emotions were felt upon our coming in line again and finding ourselves placed as we were at the commencement can only be known by the men who have been in action, dear friends. Tomorrow I shall write again. Good night, dearest Anna, God help you. And all at home, your ever devotedly attached brother, Moses B. Jenkins. P.S. You received, I hope, my telegram, which I sent to you this morning, the moment I arrived at Willard's. I found a welcome letter from you today at camp. I like that letter because, again, it gives us the immediacy of what it was like. He's thinking of his comrades in arms. He's thinking about the, the day that just unfolded. And more importantly, he wants to let his family know that he's safe. There's a lot of letters that are out there like that. We're fortunate to have this letter and to have the photograph to go along with it. So, item two. I received this note late last week and want to share it with you. It's from a gentleman named Jim Gilmore in Texas. And Jim writes, my family is in possession of 80 letters of our ancestor, Colonel James B. Griffin, wrote to his wife during the Civil War. I knew based on one of the letters that he had his picture taken in uniform. For years, I had searched and searched, hoping someday I would find it. Last week, I was looking on CivilWarTalk.com, searching for information about his outfit, Hampton's Legion, hoping maybe I could recognize him in a group photo or anything. Scrolling through the page, his name caught my eye. Hesitant that it was really him, I reached out to the person who posted the picture. He gave me a link to Military Images Magazine. I was able to track down the issue that had the picture, and to my surprise, it was a two-page story. The story made it absolutely apparent. The picture I was looking at was indeed my third great-grandfather, Colonel Griffin. At this point, Jim contacted me, got him a copy of the magazine so he could see that story and see the image. And he writes, I can't put into words all the emotions I have looking at an actual picture of my ancestor in his full uniform. Reading his letters and seeing his picture and face truly brings me closer to him and all he went through. When I was younger, my grandfather and I would look through the letters and study the Civil War together. He would be so proud knowing he found the picture. I love that story. For a bunch of reasons. Probably most importantly, we have a man who made a connection with his family. He was able to see a photograph of that family member, and he was able to piece together the history. He was able to make a connection with the letters and the photograph. It's a lot of what I think about. It touches me personally, because that's what I do when I look in the eyes of these soldiers. I re read their letters, read their stories, research their lives. It brings me a little closer to my understanding of this time period and of the war. Third item. A gentleman was in an antique shop, and this just happened, uh, I believe it was on Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday. I had a gentleman uh, shopping, an antique shop up in the Finger Lakes region of New York, and um, he's not really a photo collector, but he collects glass plate negatives. He's in the shop, and he's looking through a grouping of glass plate negatives, and he finds one and in studying it, it looks like it's a group of Civil War soldiers. So he plunks down $2 and walks out of the store with it. He goes home, he's got a scanner, and because he is a collector of these glass negatives, he has the ability to do scans from the glass negatives. So here's the image. If you close look at it, there you go. Um, you'll see some pretty cool things going on here. 
you've got um, two officers, could be major, could be lieutenant colonel, in the front with their double uh, double breasted frock coats on. You've got a bunch of staff officers, probably company level officers standing around him. Uh, towards the middle, you can see a man who at first appears to be in civilian clothing, but in fact, he is the chaplain. You can see the co cloth covered buttons of his jacket. Uh, the folks have some medals on. There appears to be one diamond shaped core badge. So there's a lot going on. Um, challenge here is to find out who these guys are. So that's a work in progress. My first step was to contact Roger Hunt, who is uh, known for, probably best known for his series of books, Colonels in Blue, that's an ongoing series. Many people know him because he has a more or less a photographic memory. He's seen so many soldiers, so many officers. Uh, it's not uncommon for Roger when you send him something to be able to tell you who it was. In this case, Roger was stumped. Um, so I'm going to be turning to other folks that I know within the network of collectors or senior editors. I'm also going to run it through Civil War Photo Sleuth, which you can check out at civilwarphotosleuth.com. It's our new application that we're working on. We're going to be, in fact, uh, debuting it. Our public launch is going to be on August 1st in Washington, D.C. So if you live in the D.C. area or happen to be in Washington on August 1st, I urge you to go visit our website, militaryimages.com, uh, or visit us here on Facebook and get the information to go to uh, Civil War Photo Sleuth to the public launch. It's going to be great. Uh, Kurt Luther who is the uh, leader of the group, the developer, and um, I dare say the brainchild of this idea. He will be there. Uh, so will all of his assistants, um, all the folks who have helped him out. I'll be there. And uh, we'll be looking at photos. We'll be showing, demonstrating how the software works and trying to identify soldiers using a combination of data, face recognition, and community, which is what you all, all, what you all are here tonight. So I'm going to put this photo through Photo Sleuth. I'm also going to post it here on Facebook, and I hope that you all can help. So now I want to get some of your questions. I've had a few held over here from last week. Uh, we didn't get to this. Let's see if you can see it. Um, this is submitted by David Yunt. Dave is with us tonight, and um, it's an interesting image. Um, you can see me a little closer. This soldier is holding what appears to be some sort of a handkerchief. Some some sort of some sort of wad of material is held um, in his hand. And David is kind enough to supply a close-up, which you can see over here, right over here. Uh, and then he's also done a reverse view, so you can get a sense of what that looks like. So interesting image, and you gotta wonder what exactly is in that hand. So what I think, I think two things. He's holding, whatever he's holding appears to be larger than a handkerchief, although it could be. Um, it's made of some sort of coarse material as far as I can tell, and he's got it wadded up. What I think is also interesting is in a way, he sort of has um, uh, brought our attention to what is holding it, what he's holding in his hand. But look what he's doing with his other hand. He has the lapel of, or pardon me, he has the edge of his jacket, and that jacket is opened, and he's showing us something inside. There's something in his vest pocket that he wants us to see. So he wants us to see what's in his hand for sure, but he's also gesturing to his what appears to be uh, either a vest pocket or a pocket that's inside of his uniform coat. So my guess is that whatever is in there, because we can see a little hint of some sort of material, is perhaps somehow connected to what's in his hand. Here's my best guess. It's some sort of a piece of cotton, perhaps something that he picked up 
on a battlefield, something he picked up on a march or on campaign, and he wants us to see it. He's telling us that there's something important here that he wants us to see. He's got a souvenir. That's my opinion. That's my theory. I don't know that for sure, but that's my working theory. I'll get this image on our site, and you all can take a look at it and tell me what you think. All right. Here's one. Came in this evening from Austin Sundstrom. Go over here a little bit. Uh, you can see this information. Austin, if you're watching, uh, your question is, do I recognize the backdrop? Uh, which if it, it may be hard for you all to see in the audience, but what we have here is what appears to be a dirt floor and then a fairly ornamental, nicely painted backdrop, which includes a terrace with a balcony and it's painted uh, in a, in it's, it's organized in sort of a 3D fashion to give you the sense that the soldier is standing on a broad terrace. That terrace is overlooking a fairly bucolic lake scene. Uh, there are um, sloping hills in the background. It's a very bucolic scene. Also, as you can see, he signed his name. The soldier has signed his name. This is Walter Tibbetts uh, of the, um, uh, he's from, he enlisted in Chicago as a sergeant uh, in Battery I of the 1st Light Artillery. Um, he was wounded at Shiloh. So Austin, one thing I do want to mention to you before I comment on the backdrop is uh, please be in touch with me at militaryimages at gmail.com. I'd like to figure out how to get a high resolution scan of this image for the magazine. We're currently working on a project that is a gallery of Shiloh casualties. And um, it would be great to be able to include Tuttle and his story in it. So um, I have to say that I don't recognize this photograph, or I shouldn't say this backdrop uh, offhand. Um, I can tell you that I looked through uh, 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 William Dara's landmark book on CDVs. I could not find it in there. Um, but I can tell you that these sorts of backdrops, these bucolic backdrops that are non-military are fairly common, as you may know. Uh, I also think that this backdrop is worthy of a lot more research to try to pinpoint where it's from. And a starting place would be to begin looking for images from Chicago where uh, Tuttle enlisted. Uh, I also think some additional research to find out where he was during his time in the service would also be helpful because if you can pinpoint some of the cities where he was, some of the camps where he stayed, you might be able, you might get lucky and find an image that has a similar backdrop and that might be able to reveal the photographer. And of course, there's a big value here because if you can identify the photographer and you can identify the backdrop, because you know that he served in the first light artillery, if you find unknown images of soldiers with that same backdrop, there is a chance that they also served in the first light artillery or other regiments that passed through the town from which this photographer was operating. There's also a chance that the photographer followed the camp of the, uh, of the regiment or the battery in this case, and uh, was something of an itinerant photograph that was operating in the camps. That is a little bit harder to track down, but I would urge you to, again, find his record, find where he was, and try to track down similar images from the towns that, uh, that he was in. So. I've got one more uh, note, and this is a question. It comes from Vince Law. And um, Vince asks a great question, and it's one that has cropped up more and more uh, in the last couple of years. He says, how has the Civil War CDV market changed over the past decade? Might you expect any big changes as the baby boomer generation gets older? Where should buyers with limited time look besides eBay? Is eBay gaining or losing importance as a marketplace for Civil War CDVs? Um, I'll take uh, the, the first, there's a bunch of questions here. Uh, first question, how has the CDV market changed over the past decade? I certainly think that uh, we've seen an explosion um, in images that have come out in recent years. Uh, certainly the 10 year period 
uh, is important to note because if you go back 10 years ago, we're looking at the recession of 2008. Around that time, uh, certainly a bunch of Civil War collectors, uh, pardon me, collectibles, uh, lost value. Um, Civil War photography was similarly affected. I think what I find nowadays is most of the images that are um, uh, common images, perhaps unidentified soldiers, uh, are not particularly gaining in value. Uh, but those that are identified, those that have unique content, they might be uh, certain equipment that the individuals have in the images with them. Uh, of course, an identified soldier from a specific regiment that's of interest, whether for um, the state in which he served, whether for the uh, regiment, or if he became a casualty or certainly had some interesting war story to tell, those still command high prices. And um, a small number of the highest quality images that have really unique stories or just wonderful images still continue to command high prices. And in fact, that's true throughout the Civil War collectibles market, but the finest material continues to gain in price. Uh, to Vince's next question, uh, expecting big changes as the baby boomer generation gets older? The answer is yes, we're already seeing that. Um, as the boomers uh, decide what they want to do with their collections, um, some of that material is coming out into the marketplace. And um, uh, that's probably not a surprise. It's important probably to note that so many collectors that I talk to define themselves as caretakers. They are holding these objects, these relics, they know the value. And I'm not talking necessarily about the financial value, but the intrinsic value of them to our history. Uh, they realize the importance of them and um, they want to make sure that they go to the hands of someone who is going to appreciate them and perhaps put the research and attention into finding out more about them. So those images are certainly beginning to make their way into the marketplace and um, uh, you find them all over. Um, so uh, that sort of leads into the next question. Where should buyers with limited time look besides eBay? Well, certainly eBay is still a strong place for images, no question about that. But uh, there are also plenty of other places. And if you have limited time, I'll give you a shameless plug uh, for the magazine. If you go to militaryimagesmagazine.com, um, you'll see all of our advertisers that are located along the bottom of the homepage. And then if you click inside, any inside page has all of our advertisers. So I would recommend that you click through and um, visit their site. There's a reason why all those advertisers are linked to military images. These are folks that we've had long-term relationships with. These are dealers that uh, we respect. These are dealers that we know are honest, they're credible, they have integrity, and they stand by what they sell. And they're often some of the most knowledgeable people in the market. So I would direct your attention there. If you have limited time, go to Military Images Magazine and just start clicking. Uh, get familiar with the dealers. Get familiar with what their strengths are. Uh, reach out to them. They're always willing to help. Certainly, that includes everything from uh, dealers that have been around for years. It includes auction sites. Um, Cowan's Auctions is certainly one of our advertisers has been with us since the beginning. Um, so I would definitely check into them. I would also note Excelsior Brigade is another uh, uh, dealer that we have a special relationship with. They advertise often through Facebook, so keep an eye out for their posts. I also want to mention social media. We've had big gains in growth there. Civil War Marketplace, you can visit uh, Doug York's uh, page and get a sense of what's going on over there. It's a very different kind of construction, uh, or a different model, I should say, um, for purchasing images. Dealers will advertise images there, put prices on, you can PM and make deals uh, and do your shopping right there. So plenty of options. I would recommend whenever you have a few minutes, whether you're clicking on an ad on our website 
or visiting Civil War Marketplace or another um, social media destination. Get to know what's going on. Get yourself some knowledge and information as you go along. And don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions. Military Images is here. Many of the dealers are willing to help you, especially if you're new to the hobby. There's wonderful deals, especially with all the images coming out on the marketplace that have, that have come out over the last few years. So it's a great time. Any time is a great time to get into Civil War photo collecting and uh, to get a sense of what it's like to live history through the eyes, through the stories of the soldiers and the sailors that were there. So that's all I have tonight. We're going to conclude this episode. I thank you all for tuning in. Stay tuned. We'll be back next week with another episode. Have a great night. Bye-bye.